In the last episode, our captain gets injured. We go aground, we sail to Norman Quay, and we help out someone who really needs it. In this episode, we hit some rough water cutting through to the ocean, we catch some fish, there's a close encounter with a shark, and our captain gives some great mooring tips. <laughs> So travelling through these cuts, the water is surprisingly shallow and really quite unpredictable. And you do have to keep a keen eye out for coral bombies or to ensure that you don't drift to the side of the channel. That's the new marina they're building there, Norman Key. It should be really beautiful. We passed the plane wreck that we saw yesterday and pass over many areas of shallow sand and coral heads just to keep us on our toes. As we approach the open ocean, the current meets the ocean swell and creates very turbulent water with white caps with waves about one and a half to two meters. <laughs> Once you get clear of the current, the water calms down back into the deep ocean swell with much more predictability and smoother sailing. This morning we were at Norman Quay, which is up here, that sort of U-shaped island. We were anchored behind there, uh, up here and in fairly shallow water. And then this morning we came out, oh here we go, here's our purple line. We came out through the shallows around and this is the cut that leads to the sea um, and that was actually very narrow um, going from like one or two meters on each side with rocks but anyway it was it was well marked on the chart not very well marked with, in fact there was no um, um, navigation pylons uh, but very well marked and that through there we were getting about two knots of current and that's just one hour within one hour of slack tide um, and then we had to come all the way out to here and then we headed off into the deeper water away from the shallows because we're really wanting to, first of all, get in safe water, uh, but also on this ridge, we're hoping to do a bit of fishing along the ridge where it goes from essentially 10 meters down to 200 meters. Here, it's actually one finger breadth between the 30 meter mark and the 100 meter and the 200 meter mark. So this is a steep drop off, should be good fish. So we've already had uh, two bites. Two bites, 
took the lines, took the lures. Took, well, no, took the hook on one and took the whole lure on the other. Yeah. And um, and that was with the nylon leaders, which I've always uh, on hand lines I always use steel leaders because these big fish just cut through the cut through the nylon. So we've got to have tough metal leaders to protect the lures. So when the northeasterlies blow, the wahoo and the bigger game fish come down to the Bahamas. So between November and March is the best time for catching the big fish like ma uh, wahoo. Right. So we live in hope. Yeah, because when we catch it, what are we going to say? Wahoo! <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely a fish on there. Yeah, I'm alright. Now, that wouldn't hurt though. Now, please tell me. Woo! Yeah, dinner! Woo! It looks like a Spanish mackerel or something. Or is it a. Ah, uh, it's a barracuda. Unfortunately, we didn't catch any more fish on the way to Wardrick Wells, and the entrance to Wardrick Wells was very easy and open. This is the start of the Exumas Land and Sea Park, where no fishing is allowed, and it is one of the largest land and sea parks in the world. They provide moorings at a very reasonable cost, so we call them up on the VHF and they allocated us a mooring. This area is stunningly beautiful, but the channels are very narrow and caution is needed. And as we approached the allocated mooring, we felt unsafe and extremely shallow depths approaching that mooring, so we chose a mooring in front of the office, which was much more easily accessible. Hey, stop. This, however, turned into not being our finest hour, as we missed the mooring, dropped the boat hook in the water, and had to go back to pick it up for a second attempt with Jimmy swimming to tie us on. Can you reach this? I'll grab it. Hold okay. on. Once attached, everything was easy and we just tightened in the ropes and tied up as usual. But there was learning experiences for us all, including the differences of being on different boats with different areas of visibility and communication issues. We all learn something every day. But just look at how spectacular this place is. This is an absolutely must-see place if you're ever in the Bahamas. Those are eagle rays or spotted rays or something.
<laughs> nice little place you got here. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> Don't tell them you're in Strathy. <laughs> Check this place out. It's the Bahamas. Look at these guys behind us. Bobbing with a beer. Check this out. Now this is a real whale skeleton right here. Jawbone, wow. July 1995. That's what it says there. Check out the whale bones. Wow. It's massive. Check it in. Consuming plastic garbage killed this magnificent 52 foot sperm whale. I don't know if you can read that. Well, that's why you try and recycle things, don't keep throw things in the ocean. And this is where we are. Because when I've seen this whale's bone before, these, this skeleton before, I had no idea it was on such a magnificent beach no idea all right a few people just yeah they're bobbing a few they're people sitting having their drinks so cute they're natives the <laughs> they're and you don't really. go too close to them because you just never know whether whether they're wild or whether they're tame and used to visitors because Pilot whale. <laughs> Stingrays or something on the edge. These are all the species native to here. When we got back to the beach, we saw the lady swimming back to the boat to get some more beers, and we heard these screams of anguish coming from her as she was near the bow of a boat, and it turns out that a shark swam and nudged or nibbled her as he swam past. Clearly the shark didn't want to eat her, but it did freak her out. Alright, so what are you doing here? Uh, well, this is day three and I'm just uh, I'm wanting to go swimming and I'm just putting some spray sealant, elasticated kind of spray band as they call it. Um, but that's just to hold the wound together while I'm swimming and hopefully keep it dry. It's still actually really tender out to about this point but there's no redness and I'm thinking this tenderness that I'm feeling is not infection. I'm pr trusting that it is just um, trauma from the original injury. So keep our fingers crossed and we'll go for a swim and hope it'll all hold together. Okay. Okay guys, so what I want, let's talk about picking up a mooring today because that's the challenge we had today at uh, Wardrick Wells. I want to run through the steps that one should always take going and picking up a mooring. So first of all, have a mooring line ready. Um, I always use a long one so that I've got lots to play with, but tie the end you're not using to the boat so it's always attached. Uh, the aim with the, the mooring line that you have is you pull up the, the line out of the, the water and feed the end through that very quickly and then you can let that all go and because you've got a big long line of of rope you've got time to tie that off if the boat's drifting away from the mooring so always go prepared have your boat hook have your rope ready and tied on at the at the back end now the second most important thing is communication 
whoever's driving the boat, whether it's a monohull or whether it's a catamaran, the person at the at the helm cannot see the mooring because it's down in the water and they're only seeing over the top of the boat. So communication from the person at the bow to the helm's person is the most important thing. What we found is letting the person know where the mooring boy is compared to the boat continuously. What we do is use fingers and because we're Australian we use meters or yards so that means we're five meters to go or four yards to go that means sorry five meters to go four meters to go three meters to go two meters to go one meter to go we're there we're past it by one we're past it by two we're past it by three we're past it by four so what that does without actually yelling backwards and forwards where you're at the person at the helm also knows the speed that you're going so if you're going like five meters four meters three meters two meters one meter like and that, it's all you know you're going much too fast so you're going to overrun it by a huge amount the other really important thing is the person at the bow needs to point to where the mooring boy is before you go in tell everybody what their job is so there's one person allocated to signaling one person to pick up the mooring with the boat hook one person to tie on or depending on how many people you have on your boat decide between yourselves what your signals mean so for example does that mean there's a rock in front of us right there or does that mean go in that direction you know does that mean we're all finished and the anchor's up or the anchor's down or we're tied on or does that mean oh my god we're about to hit the rocks organize the systems for your crew and your helms on the boat so everybody knows so in advance we've this is arrived at the boy the person leans forward picks up the tail of the mooring boy uh, grabs the loose rope with the boat hook and pulls it up this is probably the most difficult time because you have limited time that the boat will either overrun the boy or uh, be blown off the boy in a matter of minutes so you really have to pull the rope up and get it attached so you're secure before that happens and I would always recommend with the boat hook pull it up and grab the rope don't try keep holding it with the boat hook grab the rope and tie it directly onto your boat or tie it loop it around something so it will take the force if you drift off it and one final point is if you don't manage to get the mooring line on the first go you will never be able to hold the boat with the boat hook holding the mooring line. You just don't have enough power. The boat hooks are not designed to take that sort of stress. So don't even try. If you know it's not working and the boat's drifting off and you're starting to get pr too much pressure on the boat hook, kick the boat hook off and do the whole thing again. Don't try to fight with it, especially like a 50 foot leopard, 20 tons, you are not gonna be able to pull that against a two or three knot current. So don't even try to fight it, just let it go and come back and do it a second time. So I hope that's been really helpful and hope you found that interesting. Every time you approach a mooring, it's a completely new experience. So we all miss them sometimes. So don't worry about it. Just go back and do it again. You're not gonna come to any harm. Don't stress over it. Okay guys, also hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. He wants and you to do everything. <laughs> Not so easy, is it? <laughs> okay, guys, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and ding the notification bell so you get notified when we get the next one out. All the best, guys. See you later. She likes the paddle. <laughs>